In 1983, an F-15 lost its wing in a mid-air collision, but somehow the pilot safely landed. McDonnell Douglas, the aircraft manufacturer, said, no way, this is not possible. Yet, modeling and simulation revealed it could happen. Losing a wing and yet safely landing, these are both unexpected events. But now suppose we wanted to assess an aircraft's performance within its operational envelope. And we wanted to do so without flight test and all three axes of flight, roll, pitch, and yaw. Well, this can be done with aircraft modeling and simulation. Behind aircraft performance is a flight control system. Flight control design can be an iterative process involving tuning in a linear, simplified environment, then controller evaluation and a full nonlinear aircraft simulation. The engineer would retune the controller to address any issues found after full nonlinear investigation. Here, that aircraft simulation is a key element of the iterative tuning process. What if the analysis of our flight controller showed we needed a higher performance control actuation system? One could develop a model of the actuator, import it as a new module in the simulation, and evaluate its impact to aircraft performance and control. If we're planning a flight test, we'll need to predict our ability to safely meet test objectives. With aircraft modeling and simulation, we can predict the flight course over different phases and sub-phases of flight for different pilot tasks. Suppose the flight test seeks to examine the effect of fuel slosh on aircraft stability and control. Numerous references exist on fuel slosh modeling, so we could make a model and, you guessed it, assess its effects in simulation. Indeed, Aircraft simulation has many applications, including and beyond what's discussed here. In this series, we're going to step through the development of an aircraft simulation. And in this specific lesson, our goals are to introduce the simulation's essential elements and discuss important considerations when starting this effort. What are the essential components of an aircraft simulation in our three-dimensional world. At its core are the governing equations of motion. To describe aircraft motion, it becomes necessary to specify a coordinate system in the aircraft frame of reference, such as this body fix coordinate system. We will also need a coordinate system in an earth reference frame, such as this inertial coordinate system. Now clearly, the aircraft can translate in three directions. It can also rotate with respect to the earth in roll, pitch, and yaw. And together, these are six degrees of freedom that correspond to the so-called Sixdoff model. We will incorporate the Sixdoff dynamics into our aircraft simulation. And note, often the term aircraft simulation is used synonymously with Sixdoff. However, in a full aircraft simulation, there will be much more than the six DOF to the state equations. We'll also need a vehicle model to define parameters in the six DOF dynamics. These include mass and inertial properties, as well as aerodynamic data defined over a set of flight conditions. If the aircraft operates in different configurations, we'll need to include those as well, such as if the landing gear is up or down, if it's carrying a payload, or if it has an additional fuel pod. We must also consider subsystems like propulsion, control actuation, autopilot, instrumentation. There are kinematic equations that capture the attitude and position of the aircraft. For attitude, we have Euler kinematics, or alternatively, quaternions. There's the position equations, also referred to as the navigation equations. The form of the governing equations will depend on whether we make a flat earth assumption or work with an oblate rotating earth. Note these options lead to two different forms of governing equations. We must also have a gravity model. This can be a function of position on the earth and altitude. A common model used in simulation is the World Geodetic System 1984, referred to as WGS-84. There's also an atmospheric model. This captures properties like temperature, speed of sound, density of the air as a function of altitude. 
There can be atmospheric disturbances like wind or turbulence. To start the simulation, we'll also need initial conditions like initial velocity and angular rates of the aircraft. Note that the kinematics and subsystem models will add state equations to the simulation, so these will need to be initialized as well. If we're doing statistical analysis, say using Monte Carlo methods, this could also be defined in the initialization. After running the simulation, we'll want to observe the results. This is post-processing. It could be as simple as making some plots or performing a visualization of the aircraft in a flight simulator. These are the primary components of a simulation. We should also consider user interfaces. If we're making a flight simulator, then the interface could be the cockpit control. If we're performing engineering analysis, and different people will use the simulation, we may consider a graphic user interface that's intuitive for many users. For great flexibility, we could make the interface script-based, where the user writes an input file with all the necessary data to run the simulation. It could even be a combination of GUI and script inputs. Okay, this may seem like a lot, and it is, Creating a useful simulation can take days, even months, and its development to suit the particular purpose of an individual or organization, that can evolve continuously over years, especially as requirements evolve. Luckily, to start, we can greatly reduce the complexity of our simulation while still gaining a useful and interesting tool. The flat earth assumption leads to simpler governing equations. Gravity can be approximated as a constant everywhere. We could use the 1976 atmospheric model, which is just a table lookup. We can limit the subsystems to just the essentials. In fact, we could have no subsystems at all and just explore the aircraft open loop dynamics. We can focus on a single vehicle configuration. We can use Euler kinematics for aircraft attitude. All that's left is to initialize the sim, and those are the initial conditions. So now perhaps this doesn't look so complex, but this would still be a substantial tool. There are open source and commercial simulation environments. So why would we want to make our own simulation? If you code your own simulation, you learn the principles of each component and how to bring them together. This exposes you to the assumptions behind each component. This makes you aware of when the simulation is producing truthful data instead of nonsense. Given your research or engineering objectives, your simulation will need special tailoring. And having intimate knowledge of how the simulation is constructed allows you to modify the simulation to suit your specific requirements. For example, one's purpose could be to focus on weather effects, and so the specific functionality one may introduce are turbulence models or wind models. Another purpose could be to assess ballistic flight at high altitude, in which case one's functional requirements may be a good gravity model an oblate rotating earth, and perhaps a good atmospheric model. In creating your own simulation, you're going to gain new and useful skills, and that can make you more effective as a researcher or engineer. And these are all great reasons to do so, to create your own simulation. But are there circumstances where creating a simulation is actually a bad idea? Face it, creating a simulation is going to take some work you can expect to spend a significant amount of time learning about each component and coding them correctly, especially if this is your first time through. When you observe unexpected things like abrupt jumps, chattering, and signals, you're going to need to investigate what's going on, and this can take hours or even days to understand and troubleshoot as necessary. If one does not have the luxury of time, learning how to use an existing aircraft simulation environment such as the openly available JB Sim, is going to be a much more efficient path than coding your own. But when you do ultimately pursue your own simulation, let's think about your goals. Is your primary objective to learn, 
Do you want to create something for others to use? Do you want a tool to evaluate flight control design? Do you want to experiment with new aircraft concepts? Or maybe it's all of the above. Plan your simulation architecture for your purposes and plan to include the components for your specific required functionalities. But what about the programming language? Will you use C++, Python, MATLAB, Octave, Perl, Java, or some other language? Simulink and its coder capability to translate diagrams into C and C++ can be very useful to compile your code for embedded systems and hardware in the loop simulation. But Simulink costs money, and you may face renewal fees that would make the expense recurring. If you want rapid simulation, a compiled language like C++ will be preferable to MATLAB. C++ is also free, but it's more complex to implement than MATLAB. How do we know when we've coded the simulation correctly? How do we know when the simulation is accurately capturing the physics? These questions pertain to verification and validation, or V and V, respectively. This question can be applied to a single module as a unit test or to a collection of modules interconnected together as a simulation. And these are just some of the considerations when we're creating something new. And perhaps we should take it seriously, given the time we may invest. In this tutorial, we will establish a core simulation. Where you take it after that is up to you. Upcoming lessons will go through, one by one, the essential elements of a simulation. We'll focus on understanding the models, equations, and their coding, rather than their specific derivation. We'll lay things out as a process flow diagram, and show how to connect components of the diagram in code as opposed to lines and Simulink blocks. We'll build the skeleton of the simulation. We'll begin verification tests. Validation tests can also be performed by comparing our results to the results of other trusted simulations. We can apply our simulation to various problems and add new capabilities along the way. Stevens and Lewis's book, Aircraft Control and Simulation, will be the primary reference for this tutorial. You can access a link to get this book or its latest edition in the description below. An excellent application of aircraft simulation is in the IEEE Control Systems Magazine article, Adaptive Flight Control and the NASA X-15-3 Flight Revisited. This work looks to better understand a potential cause of the historical X-15 crash by investigating the adaptive flight control system. Access this lesson and more at learngnc.com. And I'd like to give a sincere thank you to each of my Patreon subscribers. You make this content possible. You keep LearnGNC going. Thank you again. That's it for today. Until next time, good luck.